I would let her sodomize me. This podcast is not suitable for children or those who are easily disturbed. Spoiler warning for whatever is in the title of this episode. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher, and Goodreads. Become part of the disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that The Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Welcome to episode 70 of the Horror of Babylon, where we are discussing where we are discussing Ringu or Ring by Koji Suzuki. And I'm Ryan. With me as always is Daniel San. Say uh say uh Konnichiwa Daniel San. Konnichiwa Daniel San. Konnichiwa Daniel San. Uh, and thank you. I to- can't call Daniel San so much in my daily <laughs> life. A wax on? A wax on. People find out my name is Daniel and I do martial arts and that's all I ever get to hear. I mean, <laughs> it could be it could be worse. It could it, be worse. Pretty good movie to, to be referenced yeah. on. Uh, and continuing the, the honorifics, uh, thank you to our pet, uh, patrons, Abigail Chan, Breaker of Chains, Mother of Dragons, and Logan, the full metal. You need to say an honorific. Logan. <laughs> Logan. Uh, Coon. <laughs> <laughs> Logan <laughs> Coon. <laughs> no, because he's younger than me. Right? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Just the full metal patron on three. One, two. The full, full metal, metal patron. <laughs> we flubbed this. <laughs> it's fine. It's funny. <laughs> uh, four Horsemen Comics and Gaming Dono. Uh, which you can visit at the Morgantown Mall in Morgantown, West Virginia, or the Mall at Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and say hello to Ronald, Ronald Senpai. It's Ronald, <laughs> Ronald Senpai, notice me, Senpai. It's not like I like you or anything, Baka. <laughs> you silly Baka. Please notice me, Ronald Senpai. I'll buy magic packs. Ara, ara. <laughs> uh, okay. Did you? Do we have any? Do we have any trigger warnings for our discussion of uh, Koji Suzuki's Ringu? Uh, rape, murder, shitty men. For the actual book, if you're triggered by uh, dead young women, then uh, yeah, yeah, steer clear. <laughs> steer clear. Okay. If you're afraid of heart attacks, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Uh, so our history with the Ring franchise, and of course, we're gonna let you kick it off because this is your jam. <clears throat> okay. So I saw the Ring back in uh, high school. I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. <laughs> and I became a little obsessed with spooky-haired ghost children. And then I found out it was uh, based off of a Japanese movie. And then I watched that Japanese movie. And then I watched the Grudge remake. And then I watched the original Grudge. And I am so upset. Uh, spoiler alert, Sadako is my favorite horror icon of all time. To the point I ordered an Nidoroid of her. <laughs> Just because they don't make actual merchandise of the character. Audience is like, well, what's a Nidoroid? <laughs> yeah. It's a it's an expensive Funko Pop. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Just a, l- a little better than a Funko Pop. Yeah, but I mean, it's like that same kind of style. Yeah, like it's a chibi cutie, 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 chibi. Yeah. And, uh, I like, uh, they, and they were going to make a, uh, a, a Nika figure of, uh, Samara Morgan, which is the American remake of uh, Sadako, and that it never ended up happening. But I, I, I love the character, and I was like, you know, I this is apparently based off of a book, and I heard that the book was super different, that there was a lot of differences. And I was like, oh, you know what, I'm going to finally read the book. So I ordered the book. God, this was probably just a few years ago. I think it was like the year before we started this podcast. I remember it was recent. And I was, uh, I read it, and I was like, huh. Uh, I didn't like that uh, as much as the um, as one of the rare examples. Where I was like, I think the movie's better. 
And uh, I actually like the book a lot more on this go-around. After reading, I guess I had adjusted expectations. But that's my history with uh, Ring. And mine is the exact opposite. Where it came out when I was in high school and everybody just like built it up and built it up. This is the scariest movie you will ever see. And I just, I didn't like the movie like at all. Um, my next experience was, I've not seen the Japanese version, but I did read the manga in high school. Uh, Hef got the manga, I read the manga. I was like, oh, I, I like that. I think I liked that more just because it it's was a manga. A, it was a manga. <laughs> that That's really the only the only explanation there. And then I haven't touched the franchise since then until I read this book for the podcast. Honestly, I was kind of dreading it because I was not a fan of the movie. Granted, that was back in high school. I have not rewatched the movie yet. I'm going to rewatch it soon, both movies, for the podcast, but I haven't done it yet because I, I wanted to get my thoughts on the book recorded for this episode without the movie coloring those thoughts at all. Like I said, I was kind of dreading it. And the book surprised the hell out of me, and I liked it a lot. Yeah, I it honestly, I liked it a lot more this go around. When I was reading it, I was going, I was even thinking in my head, man, I think Ryan's actually going to like this book because it has a lot of things in it that he likes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I was really shocked at how much I was like, this is just really engrossing. And I was like choosing to listen to it over doing other things. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. I, I think I went through the whole thing in like three days. I've read it in three days, and I'm a very slow reader. The vampires are pure myth, superstition. I may be able to bring you proof that the superstition of yesterday can become the scientific reality of today. Background. This book is written by Koji Suzuki, who was born May 13th, 1957. His first published book was Paradise in 1990. He's written several other novels and books. And he has written a book on fatherhood. Yeah, he's apparently considered like an expert on pa an expert an expert on parenting. As long as Asakawa is not his like <laughs> model for parenting, then I I honestly think that like the shitty parenting was intentional in this book. Yeah, but we'll get to that in the. I, I do. I do too. Uh, so notable works: the Ring series, which there are five. Uh, hold on, we have a uh, Ring Spiral, Spiral Loop. I'm currently reading Birthday, and then S, and then Tide, which has not so been six. which has not been uh, translated, translated yeah. into any other uh, or into English. It's so we need an official translation of Tide and an official translation of the Swedish Dracula. I want I want Tide so much. Yeah, because apparently it's the sequel to my least favorite Ring book, and I'm just like I I want to see how what he does. So. Uh, he he has won the 1990 Japan Fantasy Novel Award for Paradise. In 1996, he won the Yoshikawa Eiji Prize for New Writers for Spiral. In 2012, he won the Shirley Jackson Award for Best Novel Edge. And in 2021, the Bram Stoker Award for Lifetime Achievement, which is... I, I would have recently said uh, that was amazing, but... Due to some of the the current books that have been nominated for Bram Stoker Awards, maybe it's not as maybe maybe we can still see the Lifetime Achievement Award. It's, it's great. It's still pretty cool. Yeah, uh, he's often called the Stephen King of Japan Online. I couldn't find what the source for, for this though. I, I read that too when I, I was looking. <laughs> I was looking through all the different Ring books on Goodreads, and yeah. that was something people were talking. People about. People keep bringing it up. It's brought up in YouTube reviews, but I looked for the origin of that quote. Mm -hmm. And I can't find it. I can't find, like, who was the first person to say that or why. I, I don't think that it's really that accurate. I think I, he's just a popular horror writer. I think, that, I think that's where the where it ends. Mm -hmm. I, I, after reading him, I think it's both unfair to him and, and Stephen King. I yeah. think their styles are very different. Very. I think that uh, what they want to say with their books is very different. Yeah, I think they're both just good horror writers. And I think that calling him the first, uh, or calling him the Stephen King of Japan... And you know me, I'm I'm by no means like a liberal who wants to be politically correct. But I'm like that's like whitewashing his accomplishment his it, accomplishments. It's like calling Hayao Miyazaki the white the Walt Disney of Japan. Yeah. It's it, like no. no I mean, he, they're both animation people. Koji Suzuki is just Koji Suzuki. Yeah. Honestly, I'm reading more of his books now, and I think he has a lot to offer to both horror and other genres. I want to read Spiral and I'm interested in reading his other stuff. Yeah, I'm I Okay, so let's get... Yeah. So Ring, 
or Rangu, it was published in 1991 in English for the first time in 2003, which of course was after the American movie, which came out in 2002. And apparently, it's just pronounced ring. Yeah, apparently the U is like whenever you are you translate something from Japanese into English, there's like this little uh, noun at the end. Noun? I don't think noun. Noun. Word. Yeah. <laughs> Vow, Daniel. Vow. Okay. <laughs> and. It's more of a guttural sound than an actual ooh, mm -hmm. but it's supposed to just be pronounced ring. Okay, I'm just going to call it ring. Uh, I learned this from a YouTube video that I recently watched in preparation for this podcast. Cool. So, and the dude, uh, his second language is Japanese, so I'm like, I'm going to take his word for it. Yeah, I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> so I, I speak weeaboo Japanese. Yeah, which is where apparently the U comes from, mm -hmm. is when you uh, take the word and then translate it twice, you apparently get a U at the end. Okay, that makes sense. So the novel sold half a million copies by January of 1998, and this is seven years after publication. And then by 2000, which is two years after the Japanese movie came out, because that was released in 98. A million other copies. Yeah, it uh, sold another million copies. And of course, it's 23 years later, so hard to say how many it's sold now. Um, the Poltergeist uh, was Koji Suzuki's inspiration for to write his novel, Ring. Yeah. The Poltergeist? Yeah, like, uh, fuck. What's that director's name? He's made everything. E.T. Steven, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. Yeah. Pol so, Poltergeist. Poltergeist, yeah. Okay. That movie, the, the little girl in front of the TV, mm -hmm. that was his inspiration okay. for this movie. So, yeah, that movie's just Poltergeist. Okay, so Poltergeist was Koji Suzuki's inspiration for Ring, which that is a great movie. Yeah. Uh, we should do a bonus episode on that at some point. Uh, the, Meiji ca the Himeji Castle horror story may have been another inspiration that's about a girl who is thrown in a well and then haunts people. Yeah. That makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. It, like, in this story, this girl, uh, like a samurai, wanted to bang her. And she's like, I, wanted to bang her. I ain't gonna bang you. And so he, like, hit a plate. And so when she went to go count the plates, she was missing a plate, so they accused her of thievery and threw her in a well to execute her. So she would start haunting the castle, and she would count the plates, and when she got to uh, 10 and it wasn't there, she would scream. Ooh. And how they exercised her is they had a Buddhist monk come over, and when she got to 9, he screamed 10, and she's like, oh, okay, it's here, and left. <laughs> I was I thought you were going to say that they had a Buddhist monk come in, and he got skin and blood and <laughs> semen and bone. <laughs> Okay. Thank you for that. We're, we're moving on. Um, he decided to call this movie... Uh, he decided to call his novel Ring because of the never-ending curse of Sadako, Sadako Yamamura. It spawned an, an entire novel series, which includes six books, and has been adapted several times. Uh, what's Ring Kanzenban? Uh, Ring Kanzenban is a... a this is probably where the Stephen the video King... Game. No, no. This is where like the Stephen King comparisons come in. It was a made-for-TV miniseries. That was the first adaptation of the book, and it's the most accurate adaptation. Why are we not reviewing that? I brought it up once, and, and you just... Well, that was before I, re that's yeah. before I read the book, and I knew I liked the book. Yeah. It's it's the most... It's like the most, uh, like, word-for-word -word translation of the novel. Uh, they have exactly one change in it, which kind of started, like, the other changes that come into the uh, other adaptations. Okay. Uh, so if you want to review that one, we can. We can squeeze it in somewhere, maybe do a bonus episode. Yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can get a copy of it. And then, of course, there's the original... It, it is on YouTube. Okay, good. Uh, the Ring movie from 1998, the Japanese one. The Ring Virus? Uh, that is the Korean remake. Oh. Uh, and it, ha it includes a important detail that we will come back to later. Cool. And then there's the American film, The Ring, from 2002. Uh, Ring Final Chapter from 1999, that's... It's one of the sequels. Okay. And then... It, the... It's a t made-for-TV sequel. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Ring manga from 1996, which I have read, and then the loose video game sequel, Ring Terrors Realm for, <laughs> which the was Sega for Dream. Dreamcast, and it actually has the most to do with the third book loop. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, and it all comes back in a loop because the uh, symbol for the Sega Dreamcast is a spiral. Uh, w th this is something I'll probably talk about if we ever do Parasite Eve is when Sony was looking to adapt a horror novel into a JRPG, 
they were looking at two books and they were looking at Ring and Parasite Eve and they eventually settled on Parasite Eve. So there's a universe where Ring is turned into a JRPG for the PlayStation. Could still happen. Yeah, I mean, I would like to. And that's that. Another story in the classic, infallible three-act structure. Good enough for Aristotle, good enough for The Simpsons. Mr. Sislak, I have a feeling there's going to be one more act to this story. Well, I'm not hanging around for that. Four rags. Okay, structure and themes. Uh, structure, pretty straightforward narrative. It's all from Asakawa, aside from like... A the, couple, se- like, small sections. A couple small sections from his niece and the kid on the... The, the cabbie, actually. The cabbie, yeah. Yeah, but mostly... Asakawa's perspective. Yeah. Um, it's a narrative with the unfolding mystery that reveals parts of the last... So Themes is where we're going to have the meat of our discussion. Why don't you kick us off? Okay, so I brought this up a few times. Uh, Kagare is a uh, Shinto term. And it's the Shinto belief of things in a state of defilement or pollution, often brought by stagnation, quotation marks, still water. Like what you would find at the bottom of a well. Which I think they even bring, they don't use the word Kigare, but they use the words like still water for needing a curse. I mean, they may have in the Japanese text yeah. they use the word Kigare. And, uh, or by putting things where they don't belong. Or is uh, represented with pests and insects. Like at the beginning of this book, they very much bring up like how uh, the niece's uh, Tomiko is noticing flies everywhere. Mm-hmm. And insects is like one of those symbols of Kigari because they go around filth and stagnant water. Yep. And uh, water itself to, seems to be a prevalent theme. We recently found out my daughter is allergic to cockroaches. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I said, well, I guess you'll have to stop eating cockroaches. <laughs> I bet you love that. No. <laughs> Memes and jeans. So uh, this is actually something that was brought up very prevalently in my favorite, one of my favorite video games of all time, Metal Gear Solid 2. Sons of Liberty. <laughs> oh my God, thank you. Uh, which is about uh, how do you pass things on? You either pass them on through having children, your genetics, or through memes. And before, like, I can ask Cheeseburger what memes were, were... How do we pass things on other than uh, genetic traits? Oral history. Oral history. This very much leans into how is Sadako passing on her legacy? It's literally through a meme. <laughs> I, and my notes that reproduction. She can't. <laughs> but she found a way. It's not possible. Listen, if there's one thing the history of evolution has taught us, it's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but, uh, well, there it is. There it is. You're implying that a group composed entirely of female animals will breed? No, I'm, I'm simply saying that life, uh, finds a way. Uh, uh, nature finds a way. <laughs> I'll put that in. I'll <laughs> Thank put that you. In. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ian Malcolm. I love you. Now this is where, uh, like, we talk about we talked about earlier about how uh, Asakawa, like him being a shitty dad, is sort of intentional. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's just bad writing. I, like on the second read, especially, I was like, this is super intentional. It's through cultural isolation and responsibility. Uh, Japan, uh, the Japanese have this really prevalent work culture. The salary man. Yeah. And you're, you're even expected to go out for drinks with your boss after work just to kind of build cred. Yeah. Instead of going and spending time with your family. No. I mean, he was he was a negligent father, but, like, in a way that's culturally acceptable. Exactly. And I think that was commentary on uh, Koji Suzuki going, hey, maybe you should spend more time with your kids. And I think that's proved by how, as the story progressive progresses in how his life and eventually his wife and uh, child's life become threatened, how he more greatly values time with his family as the story goes on. Exactly. Yeah. Because at the beginning of this movie, I thought he was a complete piece of shit. (laughs) But he actually has quite a bit of character growth as it, you know, this week goes on. I agree. And I noticed that a lot more on this second read. Yeah. Like the first time I read the book, I was like, man, this guy's kind of just a piece of shit. And he is at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
and then there's another piece of shit who's a liar. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. All right. Uh, uh, chain, uh, chain letters, letters uh, ghosts, and occult phenomena. Uh, in fact, that's how Asakawa becomes so work obsessed because he. They don't explicitly say this, but he wrote an article that kind of brought shame to his newspaper. Mm -hmm. Chain letters were like a big thing back in the 90s, especially. I remember. And that's kind of brought in with the Tay eventual, like, how do you break the curse? You, I remember getting emails where it's like, you have to forward this to seven people or your house will burn down. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. and that is, uh, epidemics. Yeah. Uh, I don't, unless you read, like, if you are only familiar with the movie, the idea that this is about a virus <laughs> might kind of shock you. So, <laughs> I remember almost nothing about, I remember the videotape thing. I remember the girl coming out of the well. I remember her coming out of the TV. That's basically all I remember about the movie. So as I'm reading this book, I was like, "I is this in the movie? I don't think it is. Smallpox? <laughs> yeah, but like, this is like better than the stand. <laughs> <laughs> it was tighter than the stand. In some ways, I do think it's better. Overall, probably not, no. but I, I, but this, uh, Again, I'm not, I'm by no means an expert in, in on Japanese culture. I do have like a passive interest in it. Yeah, me too. They have been wearing face masks way longer than we ever care to. Oh yeah, and it was just kind of considered culturally responsible if you have a cold wear a to, mask. to wear a mask, so you don't sneeze and cough in people's faces. And there's if if you take all of the emotion out of it. You can't really argue with the logic of it. And that's kind of brought up in this book is how do you treat an epidemic, especially if, like, could you imagine if the only way for you to get rid of COVID was to give it to three other people? <laughs> that's basically what this book is asking is where does your social responsibility end with epidemics and where does it begin? I would give it to my in-laws and not <laughs> tell not tell them that they had to give it to other people, let them die, and let it end. I, Basically, how this book goes. I'm, that's at towards. I know we're jumping the gun, a little, jumping the shark a little bit here, but I, if I were Asakawa, I would sacrifice the in-laws and say, "All right, show it to the parents, and then let them die." I cannot wait for you to read the second book. Okay. Uh, fatalism and nihilism. It's a Japanese book. These come up a lot. Yeah. Uh, and then. Oh, the, the dual natures of originally being one. Male and female used to always be one, light and dark. Mm -hmm. This is brought up super Jedi explicitly in like a, a speech at the end mm -hmm. uh, that Ryuji gives. Yeah. But if you like read the book, and especially on my second read, I notice it more. How like uh, all of these things are about how we used to always be one thing and now how things become fucked up when we start to split each other up. It's fair. And that's all I got. Do you have any other themes to add? Um, no, not really. I, I think... I was actually pretty thorough with this. I mean... <laughs> I guess just, like, investigation mm -hmm. is, is, is a big... Yeah. I mean, that's kind of on the nose. Yeah. It, it, it does lean into the investigative aspect, and when I was rereading it this time, I was like, I, mean, I bet you Ryan's really going to love this so, part. Actually, let's... Before we wrap up structuring themes, let's talk about genre a little bit, because I, I felt like this was less of a horror novel and more of a mystery novel that had horror elements to it. It's actually it used to be categorized as a medical mystery before it was... I could see that. Before the movies, and then it was like recategorized with like the horror sub genre. I mean, it definitely has horror elements, and I wouldn't argue with it being labeled as horror, but I think the most predominant genre is mystery. Yeah, and they called it medical mystery because they were investigating how did these people die. Yeah. Um, and it actually ha has a quote-unquote scientific explanation. Quote-unquote. <laughs> yeah. Which becomes even more explicit in the sequel. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Let's move on to characters. We don't have a lot of characters, but I feel like the characters we do have, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. Let's start with our protagonist, Kazuyuki Asakawa. Uh, I'll, I'll just give my quick thoughts on each of these, and then I'll let you rant. Okay. And I, I've already said this. At, as I started reading this, like yeah, I'm a dad, <laughs> and I'm always super critical of dad characters. If they're a good dad, they're generally like my favorite character. If they're a bad dad, I generally hate them. See our uh, 
Violent Night episode. <laughs> I hate the dad in that movie. He's such Same. a piece of shit. Uh, and Asakawa, at the beginning, I was like, man, like I know there's a cultural explanation for him neglecting his family, but it's still just shitty. <laughs> and his wife is just like, just taking it because that's what she's expected to do. There's even a point in the book and in my notes somewhere quickly shifts to the wife's perspective where she's like, you're gone all day. You go hang out with your friend Ryuji for God knows how long and now you're yelling at me because I watched a tape. Yeah. <laughs> I thought... But you... she kept herself silent because that's what she was expected to do. She, like, the first half of this book, like, she's way too good for him. <laughs> but I, there are, like cultural expectations for for man and wife and, and they're both it, like you said it, it's a commentary on that and this is it's this is a japanese novel written by a japanese person and it's about japanese culture so we have to we have to try a, as americans we have to try and, and put ourselves into those cultural shoes into those roles but asakawa really grew on me as the story progressed Granted, it took his life and the life of his family being in danger for him to change, but <laughs> he still changed. Sometimes people don't change until they're met with extreme circumstances. Like you have a terrible diet and you don't exercise, and then you have a heart attack and you're like, oh shit, I need to take care of myself. I'm 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 morbidly obese and people have been telling me to exercise for years and I've been calling them fat phobic. <laughs> but now I've had a heart attack. Uh oh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Alright, so you talk about Asakawa because this is this is your your jam. Um, honestly, my feelings towards him are almost the same as yours. Uh, I'm not a dad, but one of the few things I've ever wanted to be is a dad. And so whenever I see a shitty dad, I get like v very visibly upset because I'm always sitting there like you are literally squandering one of the greatest things you can be for what. And that was my feelings when I first read this book. The second time I've read this book, I started to notice this is supposed to be a critique of the character. I'm not supposed to like him for this. Yeah. And my first read, I was, again, I was comparing it too much to the movie. This time I was like, I need to sit here, read it as a piece of literature, see what the author's trying to tell me. And I liked it a lot more because of that, because the author's sitting there going, no, this guy, you don't want to be Asakawa. Yeah. You don't want to be Ryuji. He's a cautionary tale. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he's a he's a journalist who whose job was uh, again I mentioned before it's not explicitly stated but it's kind of alluded to and you can find it in wikis and stuff and it's more explicitly stated in Rinkazabon that he wrote an article about the paranormal but he didn't like cite his sources correctly so it brought great shame to his newspaper <laughs> bring a great shame to one who's a paper. And, and so, like, people stopped reading his article. He had to take pay cuts. And that's why he's always, like, obsessed with, like, how much money things are going to cost him. Yeah. And, like, and that stuff that's... It's very subtle storytelling, mm -hmm. which is why you probably... Don't, I didn't pick up on it the first time I read it. I My notes here, not a great guy. <laughs> he's implied to be a, a lazy father by his wife, doesn't participate in child-rearing, like... Putting his daughter to sleep is considered a treat from his wife. Yeah, <laughs> he does it in the story because because he has ulterior motives, and he only does it because of ulterior motives. And then his his wife's reply is, "Oh, are you turning over a new leaf?" Yeah, and uh, alcohol is used with him in a lot of scenes. He explicitly says that he cannot sleep without alcohol. And this is the one time where I was where the Stephen King comparison came up in my brain. But it, it was the it was the alcoholic. alcoholism. Yeah. But he's still not he's not like Jack Torrance in the sense he's, that he's totally dominated. Like he's not drunk all the time. He he's it's not his only character trait, or not that that's Jack Torrance's only no. character trait. It's not his dominant character trait. It's a little bit more subtle, but it is one of those things that made me go, okay, maybe this is where that comparison came from. Yeah, and I got the sense that he's like the the guy who has one or two beers before bed every night, not somebody who's like drinking to excess like every yeah. single night. Now, one of the times it was more excessive was before he even watched the tape, but when he first showed up at the cabin and it's talking about how like he had a drink and then he's like, oh, I'll just have another. And then he's getting super short with the uh, receptionist. The Yeah, the manager. Yeah. Would you like to watch a tape? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have 
Uh, we have Star Wars. We've got Rocky. We've, we've got they, Indiana they Jones, had, Back to the Future. They literally had like a bunch of uh, English movies, yeah. which apparently American. was American, which apparently was super popular in Japan. Nineties was like those American and slashers. Mm-hmm. So I was like, because well, this uh, book references Friday the Thirteenth like a lot. Times. Yeah. yeah, and I noticed that more on this go around, and there was even like references besides just the movies like a cabin out in the middle of like a campy area mm-hmm. I was like oh okay that's kind of neat how the, that influenced this and then it comes back to influence our creepy little ghost girl movies later yeah oh, that's cool and then I have a note their wife she's and daughter Yoko but we've already kind of talked about yeah, and them they're, and they're not they're not prevalent. they're not really character they're more just like they're supporting characters to to Asakawa. It, it, they're more of like driving they're, factors. They're important. Yeah. Because I mean without them like Asakawa has like no real motivation other than saving his own life. But they do lack depth. Yeah, they're granted one of them is 1 year old. The only real characters in this book are Asakawa and Ryuji and Sadako even though Sadako is more like kind of a background idea. Yeah, exactly. So let's let's talk about Ryuji yeah. Takayama. Somehow even worse, dude. <laughs> so if you haven't read this book, pause this, read the book. <laughs> read the book. I highly encourage it. If you really don't give a shit, all right, I'm going to go ahead and spoil it. You find out right after you meet Ryuji that he brags about having raped a college girl while he was a high school student. And then he talks about how he's raped other women since then yeah, to his he, only friend, Asakawa. He occasionally just rapes people. So, one, you're finding out Ryuji is a rapist, and Asakawa is... Uh, what's it, what's it called when you're impl- like you're part of a crime, but because you don't report it? Uh, oh, fuck. Um, not implicit, but... I should know this word. I've had too many beers, apparently. Yeah, you have a criminal justice degree. Uh... Let's just go with culpable for now. Yeah, so he's he's essentially guilty because he knows about these and hasn't reported them. So this is not making either of these characters look like good guys. But then, like, the big twist at the end is you find out that Ryuji... Is a virgin. <laughs> ...and was lying about raping all these people and at the end of the book and you're like what the f-? and this is after he's dead yeah and my note here is literally edgelord who claims to be a rapist i mean so he's just like the worst guy on 4chan <laughs> i mean i guess he's he's not the worst guy he's one step below the worst guy on 4chan because the worst guy on 4chan was that guy who actually shot a bunch of women but maybe two steps because this guy because ryuji even though like in this book he's like he he's written to have like this certain social awkwardness like he chews with his mouth open and he mm-hmm. eats ice cubes super loud mm-hmm. and he's described as like buttoning his shirts all the way to the top mm-hmm. he's kind of weird awkward and a little bit gross mm-hmm. but he's also a professional he's he went to medical school and then after graduating from medical school went and got a philosophy degree too he's also super charismatic and he's one of those characters where like when you forget about what he's done, or at least what you think he, he, he has what, what done, he's claimed to do. you have to. I had to keep jerking myself back and like, oh wait, don't you can't like this guy. <laughs> like he's a he's an ass. He knows how to talk to people. Yeah, exactly. He he's he's kind of like like a light Yagami almost, where he like uh, light Yagami. <laughs> he's almost like a more awkward light Yagami. Yeah, where you kind of get on light side. But then you have to realize, oh no, he's like killing people. Yeah. Like this is this is not cool. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's. And then he has this weird relationship with this student. Uh, my my, uh, my uh, Takano, Takano. That... My oh, Takano. I remembered. You did it. <laughs> Can you tell how much I like this franchise? Yeah, she's actually the main. She she's one of the main characters in the sequel book, Ooh. the sequel, the first sequel movie, Ooh. and the second sequel movie. Nice. I mean, so. she was cool. I like yeah. my. That's fine. And I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that the set of this set of characters is continued. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously not Ryuji. Uh, Ryuji is continued, but oh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> sweet. Ryuji's like uh, sort of a background big player in the sequel novel. Cool. 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 Um, it opens with his autopsy. 
Oh my. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, I mean, that, that's basically my thoughts on, on Ryuji. Like, um, I just had to keep reminding myself that he's just charismatic. He's not a cool guy. Don't you, you can't hang out with him. This is the kind of guy your mom would say, hey, you cannot play with this kid. And I do want to share this quote. I went out of my way to make sure I, I recorded this quote correctly. <laughs> this is of uh, Ryuji. While viewing the extinction of the human race from the top of a hill, I would dig a hole in the earth and ejaculate into it over and over. Which which was a quote he gave to Asakawa for a paper he was writing on him. Which now, after having read the entire book, I don't believe. Mm -mm. I think he's full of shit and he's just saying he, that he's to He's an be, edgelord. Yeah, he's just saying that to be controversial. Yeah. So he's essentially like my least favorite kind of person. I was like, I don't... <laughs> Which is funny because you kept calling me Ryuji before we recorded this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, Sadako, go. Okay, so if you've seen the movies, you might be surprised that Sadako really doesn't show up in this book. No. Like at all. No. Um... You get a lot of background information on her. She is the cause of everything. Mm -hmm. But she never shows up. Not even in a ghost form. Spoilers. Nope. I mean, her bones. Yeah, her bones show up. But what is left is like the legacy she she tried to leave behind. So I'm going to go through my notes here. Please excuse my Japanese pronunciation on these words. I Ninja? Ninja, which is psychic photography. Uh, she used that to create the curse tape, and it's applied that she's always been able to do it. Especially whenever they go to that, like, place with all the, like, psychics, uh, like, like files. Like psychic catalog. Yeah. She can create psychic photography by imagining an image on blank tape, and it will appear on the tape. Hmm. That's a, a power she was implied to have in life, which is why in death her willpower was able to create the curse tape. Besides the uh, psychic photography, it was implied she had the power to stop hearts while she was alive. Uh, Which is where the, the curse of the tape came from. Yeah. And uh, that that's brought up whenever like the uh, other like tertiary reporter character goes to interview the, uh, the theater troupe she used to belong to. Yeah. And they're like, oh, that one dude said he was going to go claim her as his woman, and he showed up the next day and died of a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, she wanted to be an actress, so she joined the theater group Soar, which I just think is the worst theater group name I've ever heard of. Uh, so it's Soar, S-O-A-R, as in like fly, fly, which which makes sense, and I understand is cool. But the issue is is Soar is a homonym for S-O-R-E. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And, and up, uh, she was claimed to be uh, not especially talented. She was like mediocre. Yeah. Um, this is the big one of the big twists of the book and comes back to a lot of the themes. Sadako in this book and in only one other adaptation, which I will bring up, has testicular feminization syndrome, which means she is biologically male, she's intersex, but she identifies as female. She identifies as being a woman. She has male and female genitals. She... So how this works is is uh, she has like an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. I think I think specifically she is supposed to be X Y Y. So she has developed breast, sort of a feminine face, but kind of has like they even bring it up in the book. Man, that that face is sort of alluring, but there's sort of like a man quality to it as well. She it's constantly referred to as how beautiful she is, though. Yeah. So she has fully developed testicles, or shriveled testicles, and what is called an inverted penis, which is a penis that is kind of shooting up into you like a vagina. This is great. <laughs> and this might sound weird to you, but it actually plays into the book's themes of how do you pass things on. I would let her sodomize me. Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> So, that trait is sometimes brought up as a... I've seen it brought up as a criticism of the book, like, why is this a thing? But it actually kind of plays into the themes, especially when you go back to the cursed tape, mm -hmm. and it's like, you're going to give birth next year. Well, 
what she gives birth to is the ring virus. Yeah. Uh, when that was said, I was taken back. Yeah. But the more like I sat with it, the more sense it made. And what it and again, uh this uh, this book has a lot of subtle things where it's not set out right and it's sort of inferred and you have to like look at interviews and other adaptations to figure out what he's talking about. I can imagine that being like the the child orgy of this book where <laughs> people are told that out of context without having read the book mm-hmm. and it just being oh that's stupid I'm not going to read the book. <laughs> and and what it is is Sadako identifies as female. So like she, she might be bi- she's not trans but like she's intersex, intersex but yeah. but identifies as female. Mm-hmm. But she wants to give birth, she wants to have a child. Mm-hmm. Physically, that's impossible. Right. But nature finds a way. <laughs> <laughs> but she doesn't give birth to a child. She but she gives birth to a virus. By combining... Her psychic powers. With the smallpox virus. <laughs> which she gets from Jotaro. <laughs> Jotaro Nagao. Yeah, who... Uh, that's the person who murders Sadako uh, after but, raping her. But... It's because Sadako made him. <laughs> At least according to Ryuji. <laughs> this is one of those areas where I'm like, I'm not sure what Koji was trying to get across. Or if it was a actually insensitive or I'm missing something in context. Where Ryuji's like, who would want to die a virgin? <laughs> I mean, from my perspective, yeah. yeah. Who would? However, I have met... And, and liked and interacted with asexual people. Yeah. They exist. They're, yeah. They're out there. And at the same time, who would want to die for it? Yeah. But, again, I don't know if, like, Ryuji was supposed to be right there or if he was supposed to be wrong. It's a little unclear to me. Hmm. Um, I, I made a note about her mother. She inherited her psychic powers from her mother. A lot of her motivation comes from people calling her mother's psychic abilities a fraud, which is clearly not true. Nope. (laughs) All the psychics in this book actually have psychic powers. Yep. (laughs) And my, my, the thing that I remember most about her mother was that she literally threw herself into a volcano. And, uh, the biggest thing about Sadako is she doesn't crawl out of a TV in this. No, that's straight from the movie. That is straight from the movie. Which is probably, like, if you talked, if you pulled a random person off the street, that's probably what. And you said the ring, oh, the little girl crawling out of the TV. That that's probably what they would know. <laughs> and uh, so, so I am going to spoil a small part of Ring Kazanbon for you, mm-hmm. and a small part of the book for the audience, which we give spoiler warnings. So no, these, it's a full spoiler <laughs> review. <laughs> You're supposed to have read the book with us. It's a book club podcast. I and mean, obviously you don't have to, but that's, <laughs> but, but still, that's the intent. That's the idea. Yeah. Uh, so in the book, the big reveal is like what the people see is themselves aged up in this extremely grotesque way. Mm. That's what Ryuji sees in the mirror. That's implied what uh, Tomiko saw when she turned around was herself like decaying. And that's what Ron saw in the mirror was himself <laughs> Aged up in, in like the winner of the the <laughs> the Quidditch thing, and in Rankazabon, the first change they made is when Ryuji turns around, he sees Sadako holding a child, which the ring virus is what she's holding, hmm. and that's the big reveal. And that's when people start going, "Oh, hey, we can just incorporate Sadako into the media." Kill you all! <laughs> I'll drive you crazy, and I'll kill you all. I'm every nightmare you ever had. I am your worst dream come true. I'm everything you ever were afraid of. Uh, let's jump to scary shit. And we'll, we'll start with our, our customary question. Is this book scary? I don't think so. I wasn't scared by it. No, I don't I, think it is. I, I, I think that if you're prone to certain things being scary... Like, if the idea... I mean, I'm sure the idea of rape scares everybody. I'm yes. afraid of getting raped myself. <laughs> but but at the end of the day it's like if that's enough to terrify you then anything with like sexual content's probably going to f- frighten you. And like I said, I I really identify this book more as a mystery with horror elements yeah. than like a straight up horror novel. 100% agree. 
Uh, my first question is like, is the curse tape scary? Not really. No. Yeah, um, don't watch it. <laughs> I, I I do think the idea of like when Asuka was first watching it, and then like. The idea of me, if I was watching a video and then all of a sudden I could feel myself holding a bloody baby. I would probably turn it off. <laughs> I would probably get scared. But the tape says if you turn it off, you'll just die. <laughs> so Oscar will get to pass because when he watches this tape, he doesn't know that it's cursed and it's going to kill him. But then he offers it to three other people. <laughs> yeah. His, Ryuji, the other reporter, and his editor. And Ryuji, the the son of a bitch who would ejaculate into a, a hole while watching the human race die. This is a game. <laughs> yeah, he, he'll watch it. And the other two people do what any sane person would do. Uh, no. I, I, you're probably full of shit. But just in case. Just in case. <laughs> no. It's like saying, like, have you ever turned off all the lights and stepped into a room and said Bloody Mary into the mirror three yeah, times? No, just just <laughs> in case. Why? <laughs> Why take the risk? I've gotten up to saying it twice, <laughs> and I'm 35. It's like wearing a seatbelt. Like, 99.99% <laughs> of the time, that seatbelt's not going to matter, but you wear it just in case. Exactly. Uh, the ticking clock element, if you're, like, super nervous about that sort of shit, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Being Ryuji's friend sounds scary. I think that's the scariest part. <laughs> I'm, the scariest part the scariest part for me is there might be people I'm close to in my life who have done terrible shit that I don't know about that I shouldn't associate with but I don't know about them. yeah well, I haven't talked to him in years so that's and that's gonna, gonna stay that way uh, and the cursed wife and daughter like if your kids were cursed to die he's and, a bad bad man and you had to like find a way to uh, save your wife and daughter. I'm sure that would terrify a dad. Yeah, yeah, and and it would be scary for sure. It's just you know, it's hard to be scared, but because it's so like, yeah, not real. But obviously, if the situation were happening, it w it would be the worst. Kiss me, fat boy. <laughs> Kiss me, fat boy. <laughs> the rape of Sada Sadako. That was weird. It, 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 and it's brought up super early, even though you're not supposed to know what's going on. Is like mm -hmm. the dude who's like running out of breath and looks like he's like rocking back and forth. Mm -hmm. Well, he's fucking humping Sadako, but you're seeing it from her point of view. Yeah, and he's like. And, like, Asakawa even talks about feeling a pain in his lower abdomen. So I'm going to have to, like, get you to clarify. He he raped her on his own will, but she influenced him to murder her. But she allowed the rape to happen knowing that she would then get him to murder her. Is that correct? That's what Ryuji theorizes. Okay. I don't know if that's actually true, and the sequels kind of muddy that. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, even the second sequel kind of really confuses what her motivations are. I mean, the sequel confirms her motivations is just to kill as many people as possible. Mm. But I honestly do not know, but that is a scene that happens. Is an intersex person is raped and then thrown in a well. And then he throws rocks on her. Those testicles didn't stop him. <laughs> well, he didn't notice them until after he was done. That's what he says. <laughs> oh my god, are you Stephen King? No, I'm Dean Koontz. Oh. Alright, King and Koontz. Ryan, what is your king? Uh, the, the, just the investigation, the, the running down of the leads, the invest, the, uh, the, uh, interrogating witnesses the, the and the clock that he's put on that like unlike you know your typical mystery story you know like Sherlock Holmes never I mean sometimes he has like a, a time limit mm -hmm. but it's never like okay you have a week or you will die <laughs> so Asuka was like constantly getting stressed why are we taking a break to eat lunch I can't fucking eat lunch <laughs> and Ryoji's like e yeah, but we also can't function if we don't have lunch. <laughs> yeah. I, fucking like? I, I love how logical Ryuji seems in those moments. Like, bro, just eat your noodles. <laughs> yeah, eat your noodles. Drink your tea. Oh, uh, let's let's sleep. No, we don't have any time to sleep. I'm gonna die, and you have a day on me, you son of a bitch. <laughs>
I, I just loved it. I thought I thought it was great. Yeah. And I'm not so I'm a huge like mystery person, but it's only like a couple specific uh franchises like Sherlock. I read everything every Sherlock Holmes novel and short story that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle has written. And I've read some like stuff that other people have written. Um and my, f- my favorite parts of it were like the uh, journal entries yeah, where like he was investigating Mike what happened in, before. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then like I'm also in, in like anime manga wise, big fan of uh, Detective Conan and the Kendaichi Case Files. And I, I want to get start getting into Agatha Christie, but it's just something I haven't had time for, mm-hmm. uh, mainly because I'm reading so much horror for the stupid <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, uh, but like it's hard to find time for other things. I'm not a mystery fan who's like you know there are mystery people who's like all they read is mysteries, and I'm reading a, like a new paperback mystery every week. Mm-hmm. I'm not like that, but I'm like I am like a Sherlock Holmes nerd. I I like mystery elements. Yeah. But so, yeah, that's my king. And your king? My king is... Sadako. Uh, <laughs> no, because she doesn't show up in the book. Yeah. Uh, my king's the same. Is I think the investigation is great. I think the way they kind of go about solving the mysteries is great. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there, there are a lot of things that are kind of like, oh, that's kind of a nice coincidence. Yeah. Like, uh, he just happens to be friends with Ryuji, who is a <laughs> philosopher, a medical doctor... <laughs> And knows about paranormal psychology. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm like, you know what? Whatever. If that's the biggest leap, it's yeah. not that bad. Like, Sherlock Holmes is also an expert in a lot of things, and he's a weirdo. Yeah, and <laughs> one of the things he's not an expert in is medical stuff, and he's conveniently roommates with a medical doctor. Yeah. So, I mean, come on. Um, okay, then Kuntz. My Kuntz, uh, and this is a nitpick. Like, it didn't really affect my enjoyment of the book. But every person that Asakawa tells the story of, I watch this tape, and I'm going to die in a week. Literally every person he tells <laughs> believes him. Yeah, they're like, this probably isn't true. So his, but <laughs> his friend, his wife, the other reporter, his editor, they all believe him. <laughs> they're all like, you know what, I ain't risking it. Yeah, which is just very unrealistic, but also the story wouldn't really work if they didn't believe him so. and, and he he also tries to get them to watch the tape to accept his wife as i was reading it and he's like explaining it to his boss i'm like wouldn't a simpler thing have been to just say that he blows off work for the week instead of like trying to justify it to his boss but then he ends up using like the newspaper's like resources yeah. for his investigation so it kind of makes sense can but... you at least get a story out of it yeah can yeah. you at least get a story out of it before you die so I mean like it, it's a nitpick I wouldn't change it but it's yeah. it, it takes you out of it a little bit my count is a little bit more meta and this is because I read the book after seeing all the things I loved about Sadako is I wanted more Sadako <laughs> Yeah, there's not a lot of Sadako. I would have liked a little bit more Sadako. Yeah, a little Sodomy, a little Sadako. Which I get in the sequel. Yeah, Sodomy or Sadako? Yes, All actually. Right. Cool. <laughs> Is it Sodomy from Sadako? All right, I guess I'll, <laughs> yeah, have, yeah, I'm just saying. I'll have to read Spiral. I shrugged there. I'll have to read Spiral. Um, okay, rankings. Um, I actually... I, I ranked it... Um, this is the first time like that's pretty high <laughs> yeah i it's in the top half it's three four five six seven eight nine it's my <laughs> number nine it's in your top ten it's above carmilla and below the stand and this is the first time i've ranked a book this high since powers of darkness wow yeah and i like i said i was just really shocked at how much i enjoyed it and honestly i think I could find an argument for it being above the stand even just because it's so much tighter. Yeah, it, it, it it's a little bit more faster paced because yeah. they give you that ticking clock element. They give you... Uh, the stakes are a little bit more immediate where in the stand, the stakes are higher but you don't realize it quite at first. Yeah, but I just like the high points of the stand are are so, so fucking high. Yeah, so I I didn't feel right putting it above the stand, but I could see on another day Same. Where, where I may. And it's a lot for me to rank it above Carmilla and Phantoms and the Scarlet Plague, too. Um, I remember when the Scarlet Plague was the bottom of 
our list, <laughs> and now there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine books <laughs> below the Scarlet Plague. All right, here's your l- yeah, here's your list. Um, I think I'm gonna put it right below Phantoms. So almost the same spot I have it in. So it's your number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's your number eight, or is it, it was my number nine. It's below Phantoms and above Power of Darkness for you. For me, it was below the stand and above Carmilla. Yeah. And again, you can see our uh, rankings by joining our Discord. Join uh, the discussion. Yeah, the, the disc, which it, it's getting a little more lively lately. Thank you, uh, Allison, and thank you, Remy. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, like uh, you can join the Discord, go to the rankings channel, get a link to the Google Doc, and see my list, Daniel's list, and Hef's list. I had a dream last night that we added a fourth co-host. Really? Yeah. Was it Carrie? It was Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> and she was she was on every week. Because I tag her and I, as one of our co-hosts all the time on our Twitter. Yeah. Though okay. Remy did say that she would be happy to come on and give a female yeah. perspective sometime. Yeah. I, if you get like. So. I mean, you can even send her, like, our schedule for the rest of the year and say, hey, like, what do you want to do? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fun. Oh, no, I completely agree. As long as she doesn't talk about Steve anymore. That's totally <laughs> fine. Um, the one time we were butthurt. Okay, homework. And I have a homework. <laughs> okay. Then we'll do yours, and then we'll do mine. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do Okay, so our homework is, you are cursed. Who do you choose to help you break the curse? And would you trust someone like Ryuji? And my answer is easy. It'd, it'd be you and your Ryuji. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Except you're not a liar and you're not a virgin. <laughs> I mean, you're kind of a liar. You're, yeah, I am kind of a liar. You're kind of a liar. Not as big a liar as Ryuji. Not anymore. No. And also you have guns. I don't know how, how helpful guns would be against... I would try to shoot Sonico. <laughs> Let's shoot the virus. <laughs> Look. Um... I would also choose you. You're not Ryuji, but I would trust Ryuji mostly just because he has so much going for him. You haven't seen Borat 2, have you? No. So in it, <laughs> he, uh, he, like, COVID is, like, a huge thing in it. Mm-hmm. And he goes into, uh, like, COVID uh, quarantine with, like, two rednecks. And the, they, like, spend quarantine by reading, like, uh, Trump stuff online. And they're just ranting about how Hillary Clinton is the devil. And yeah. How, and how COVID is a lie, but they also won't go out. <laughs> they still, they, like, still quarantine. Okay. And they, they, uh, uh, it's hilarious. That right? sounds funny. Yeah, I need to watch it's, that. It's really funny. It's nowhere near as good as Borat or Bruno, but it's worth 90 minutes. So what's your homework? Um, Okay, so uh, Asakawa goes to the, what do you call it, the resort, and he looks through the movies and literally lists out, like, maybe my three favorite, like, aside from The Lord of the Rings, maybe, like, my three favorite movie franchises of all time. He's like, oh, Star Wars, Back to the Future, Indiana Jones. Nah, I don't want to watch any of that (laughs) shit. So... (laughs) Asakawa has literally the worst taste in movies ever. Tell me, what do you think are Asakawa's three favorite movies of all time? I think that he uh, he's one of those like uh, film snobs. I, Citizen Kane is his favorite movie. Yeah, like, but I think he's also like a cultural film snob. He's like, I don't want to watch American cinema. Where's my Where's my Japanese? Yeah. Aquino. Yeah. And I don't know enough about Japanese films to know what those are. So maybe like he likes, or maybe he'd be like, oh, my favorite movies, Kurosawa. Uh, I was gonna say like Citizen Kane, Ichi the Killer, <laughs> and Neon Genesis Evangelion: The Second Rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> Only those weren't out whenever. This I know. Was. <laughs> but yeah, that that's kind of what I picture. Like one of the tapes they record over for uh, whenever they record over Ryuji, which comes up in the sequels, is they record over a, uh, I think it's Frank Sinatra concert. Yeah. And so I'm picturing he likes concerts, he likes music. Yeah. Maybe he just doesn't like, I mean, I'm sure everyone likes movies, but he's not, he doesn't go out of his way to watch blockbusters. No, and like, I think it mentioned that he's like, oh, I saw those movies in college, so it's yeah. not like he hasn't seen them. Yeah, he's just like, oh, what, yeah, Friday I've the se- 13th? I've seen that. 
Yeah, but he puts Friday the 13th up there with Star Wars. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, for some people, that's probably accurate. <laughs> yeah. But... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Question for the listeners. Uh, would you copy the tape and spread the curse? I already told you, like, I would just, I would <laughs> save my wife and kid and I would sacrifice the in-laws and let it in there. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. And I like my in-laws. Like, I'm, I'm unlike most people, I like my in-laws, but... I, I mean, they're adults, they've lived their lives, and I'm going to save the kid. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. And we're going to stop the global pandemic. Uh, further reading. So what What else? Additional works by Koji Suzuki. Spiral, uh, Birthday S, Tide. Uh, and then you have stuff Loop. like Edge, uh, Dark Water. I haven't read Pomegranate of the Gods yet. Pomegranate of the Gods? Yeah, it's another book he wrote. I haven't read it yet. But I'm sure it's written set, like in a similar style. If you like his books, you like his books. Yeah. Also, Tomoe. Yeah. And Naoko by Kego Higashino. I had not heard of that. I don't know that. Okay, so uh, Naiko. This is the premise of this book, and I've been trying to convince one of my coworkers to read it for years. Uh, this guy is on a uh, bus with his family. Mm. Speed. Uh, he has a wife and a daughter. The bus crashes, and a bunch of people die in the bus crash, including the wife. When the daughter wakes up... Pretty face. She 100% believes she is the wife. Mm, and not the uh, daughter. And exactly the stuff you think is going to happen, happens. Hard, <laughs> I'm good. Hard pass. <laughs> I no, think it's a you. great book. And he keeps like... There's like this scene where she like sneaks into his room and goes... And she's like, what if I use my mouth instead? And he's like, nope. You know what? You lost Lolita is also one of your favorite books. So It's like my third favorite book. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Um, I'm going to say uh, Goth. I've not read the, the novel. I really want to. I want to do it for the show. But I've read the manga. Uh, so Goth is... Goth is in, um, in the, near the top of my reading list, too. Yeah, it's a Japanese horror novel. Uh, there's a movie adaptation and a manga adaptation. I've read the manga adaptation twice. I didn't I, know there was a manga. Thank you to our patrons, Abigail the First, Breaker, Chains, Mother of Dragons, and... Logan. The Full Metal Patron. I was going to call him Logan Coon again. <laughs> Logan. <laughs> Logan the Coon. I, I heard Logan Coon. Logan Coon, will you, will you walk home with me today, Logan Coon? Oh, I, we shouldn't leave Abby out of this. Abigail Chan, will you walk home with us? <laughs> Care to your books? Uh, and thank you to Four Horsemen Comics and Gaming, which you can visit at the Morgantown Mall, Morgantown, West Virginia, at the Mall of Robinson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You walk in and yell, Notice of me, senpai! And you'll get a really strange look from Ronald III, Grandpa's Grandpa's Christmas. Grandpa's of Christmas. <laughs> Be like, what's a senpai? <laughs> Is that is that like a Japanese type of pie? I like cream pie. Is that like <laughs> melon flavored pie? <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for reading Ring by Cody Suzuki. I I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Uh, and thanks for recording. You're welcome, Brian. And stay tuned for our socials and stay a scary. Stay a scary. And now for the obligatory socials. Please like, share, and subscribe. Follow Daniel at DStarSick on Twitter. Follow Ryan at Darth Damio on the Bluebird app. You can find the podcast on Twitter at HorrorPod69. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Slasher, and Goodreads. Become part of the Disturbed community by asking for the Facebook group and Discord links. Send dick pics to the Horror of Babylon podcast at gmail.com. Support the show at patreon.com slash the Horror of Babylon. In closing, you can let your friends know that The Horror of Babylon is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible and all other major podcast apps. Stay scary.